welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Jess, I teach illustration here, and I am super thrilled to introduce Craig Rousseau tonight. Uh, Craig has penciled, inked, colored, worked on some really major titles for major comics publishers. He So he's a professional comic book artist or cartoonist, depending on right what you want to say these days. Uh, and he's worked for DC a lot. He's worked for Marvel. He's also worked for Image and Dark Horse, the other major comics publishers, as well as a number of others. Uh, titles he's worked on include Batman Beyond, Harley Quinn, Young Hellboy, really fun one, uh, and a number of others. He's also worked on original titles such as Perhapanauts and Cura Alien Jungle Girl. So please join me in giving a round of applause for Class of 93, Craig Rousseau. Hi. Uh, yeah, uh, Craig Russo, class 93, uh, illustration 94 for painting and fine arts. Uh, I was just saying that when I graduated in 93, I was I almost enough credits to, to get my painting degree. And I applied for a job in the residence life program. And I got a job as, as a hall director. And I had no experience whatsoever as an RA. So uh, I said, why not? How bad can it be? And uh, I stayed for an extra year and I got a degree in painting. And then I, I grew up in, in Somerset, Mass, which is not far from here at all. I'm sure you guys might know where that is. Uh, when I graduated, I said, I am going to become an illustrator and I'm going to go live anywhere I want. And then I moved five miles down the road. Uh, so i um, been working in comics since I left here, and it's been almost 30 years, which I find absolutely crazy. Uh, I I have my son who is a sophomore here. He's in the uh, art history and philosophy programs. He put together this slideshow and found some funny pictures of me. So there you go. Uh, I'm going to see if I can figure this out. I work a lot of, of, of digital these days, but uh, if it's not Photoshop or Procreate, I really don't know what I'm doing. So arrow down. All right, here we go. All right, so I, I like I was saying, I was here in the 89 through 93 in the illustration program. And some of the, these are some of the examples of the work that I had done back then. And I was still trying to find my way as an illustrator, trying to find different styles. And we did colored pencil, we did line art drawings, we did uh, you know, we had prompts for illustrations. And that was back in the day when you had modems and you had, these big clunky lap you know, desktop computers and whatnot. Uh, so we are always encouraged to try different things. And I'm sure you guys, if you're in the illustration program, are doing that. You're trying different styles, techniques, uh, kinds of illustration. It wasn't always just comic book. In, in fact, it was largely not comic book. I don't think there was really that much interest in the comic at that point uh, in that class. And I thought, you know, comics are great, but uh, I want to do something more, maybe become a children's book illustrator or do some magazine illustrations. And and I really wanted to branch out. And then eventually I came right back to comic books, which is you know, full circle. So let's see. We also have, uh, okay, there's a drawing of Ira, the model, who's uh, recently passed away. I, I read that story. Um, and that's the flyer for our illustration uh, senior exhibit, which we put together. And I was explaining, you know, it was fancy because we had two color printing on that thing. And uh, we had it in a library in Somerset. And, and it was a very different, uh, diverse class of illustrators. And I'm looking at the names now, and I think maybe a couple are still illustrators, but a lot have gone on to do other things. So I'm still in touch with a few of them. Uh, my senior project that year was comic book pages. And I, oddly enough, do not have any in this presentation. So uh, I really did enjoy being here in the fact that the illustration teachers, it was, it was a, uh, Bob Barry and Karen Klingon, really pushed us to do different things. And then the fine arts teachers I had, I had Severed Haynes, Sig Haynes, and uh, Karen Klingon, not Karen Klingon, um, Lori, Lori? Capitalists, and they pushed us in different directions. It was very much a uh, fine arts illustration 
kind of bunny heads and trying to figure out how the two of them can work together uh, because creating art is is awesome being paid for it more awesome uh and getting paid for it one of my first jobs as an illustrator i worked on campus doing flyers for different events that we had uh for the student activities board and you can kind of tell it. this was back when we had an apple 2c computer in our office here on campus in the campus center and we had to print out type and then whack hot wax it and stick it to the illustration board and we would lay out all these things and make photocopies of it and that was as high tech as things got back then and it's come a long way now with you know illustrator and other programs like that uh and I, again i was learning my style trying to figure things out and i was trying different techniques with for pitograph pens and brushes and ink and uh now again, it was fun to just try new things. And the worst thing that happened is a flyer that went up and it went down the next week. So it wasn't really a lot of pressure. Another thing I did when I was here on campus was I worked on a, a comic strip called College Norms with uh, Norm Barber, who was the director of new student programs, I think. I think that might be his title. Uh, and Norm was a faculty member and he was trying to write this comic strip as a way to deal with some issues that students might have been having of moving in and and being in college for the first time so they were they were kind of an educational comic strip and i believe he did a doctorate with this and originally uh one of my friends john had drawn the strip and then after he left they asked me to draw it so i i started working on it and um Again, you can see that it's a sign of the time with that big clunky TV in that one uh, picture there. And uh, I use these weekly strips as a way to just try new things, try new techniques. There's a zip -a tone on some of those drawings in there. And uh, I had to hand letter everything. And it was, it was a lot of happy accidents, I think, happened when I was kind of figuring this stuff out. And if you look uh, on the right side there's two strips that look a little different as time went on uh, norm asked me to redo a few so I, I tried to refine my style a bit years later and say what would i do then and i'm sure that if i did it now it would look different still which i think as an artist we're always trying to to grow to change and if i looked at my artwork uh now and it looked the same as my artwork from 10 years ago i'd, I'd kind of feel bad about that because I'm not pushing myself to try something new and I may fail spectacularly or I may not be something you notice but hopefully I notice that I've changed and grown as an artist so uh, this was something that started as a, a project in my illustration class and I think after I graduated I just kept working on it for fun and and it was a children's book illustration for, for Tall Tales, clearly, what it says. And that was um, I did a series of four paintings. I think the, this one, uh, I don't even remember his name at this point, Old Storm Along, maybe? I had done after college. And I, and, and I went back and I reworked some of the older ones to kind of try some new things in there. But I had done black and white spot illustrations to go with it. And again, this wasn't for anything but just for me as an artist to try to try new things and grow. And I don't even know that I did much with it. It was just fun to do. Yeah, there's the rest of them. Uh, I think it originally started with that, that Pecos bill in the upper left-hand corner. And I just reworked the paints on these. I, and because a lot of times art doesn't have to be final until it goes to print. And this never went to print. So I took the, the opportunity to just keep working it. And I was trying different things with, with the uh, line artwork and the black and white ones with textures and patterns and, and, and seeing what I can get away with. And my style, you can see it progress as the drawings progress, I think. So now we're into comic books. Uh, I 
was here and in classes with my friend Dave Tata, who has unfortunately passed away. Uh, and Dave had friends, a good friend who worked at Marvel Comics, and he was an intern there, and he worked in the creative service department. And and Mike was Mike Thomas was kind enough to say, "Let me look at your samples. I can't give you any work, but I can kind of give you some feedback as to what you should do, and I can connect you with some people that may be able to give you some more advice." So and this was back when uh, before the internet, and you would physically send photocopies of artwork into the office in hopes that someone would see it, or you would you would be able to just take a drive to New York City and sit in the office and wait for someone to meet with you and um, they did. We I went down and, and met some some folks at DC Comics and went to lunch with some assistant editors who who knew Mike, and I gave them some samples. And a couple of weeks later, they called and said, "Hey, do you want to do you want to draw a, a book called Impulse?" Absolutely, I'd love to. Uh, and at that point, I, I graduated and I was working at a sign shop slash art store up in Woburn, and. I started working on the, the comic book on the, on the side. Like at night, I'd go home and work, and then I'd go back to work the next day. And they were very positive about what I was doing. And I was about maybe halfway through my first issue. They gave me a second one. And then halfway through the second one, they said, we'd like to offer you the book full time. Walked into work the next day and quit. And then they said, oh, but it's going to be a couple months. So I had a lot of free time on my hands, uh, which, again, I think was a good start of how freelance work works where you don't always have a steady schedule and you really got to pace yourself and uh, plan accordingly. I'll talk about that later. So, you know, I worked on Impulse for over two years and it was kind of amazing because that was my first real regular steady comic book work. And, and so many people will say, oh, how do you break into comics? And I could tell that story and no one else is going to break in the same way. And, you know, everyone's story is different. So, I can only give you my story and say what helped me. And, you know, again, you know, you're not going to go into the office these days. You're going to you know, put something online. You're going to put together a comic strip. It's going to, editors will see it through Instagram or they'll see it on Webtoons or they'll see it somewhere else. And you build a fan base in a very different way. Uh, let's see. So, fun fact that impulse cover, uh, there's, um, three characters in the back with the big red hair and two guys in the hats are in a band called Southern Culture on the Skids. They're one of my favorite bands. And I, on a whim, I, and, and then Frank Black from the Pixies. Uh, I drew them on the cover just for fun. And apparently I was not supposed to. I found out later, like, you can't do that without asking them or we get in big trouble. But uh, in a really weird kind of story, my one of my cousins lives down in North Carolina. This is years later said, I was doing an Airbnb and I walk in and they had your comic book on the wall and it was signed and there's a whole bunch of music memorabilia. And it turns out that it was it was Dave, the drummer from Southern Culture on the Skids had heard about the comic and bought it. So it was great. So uh, I didn't get in trouble for that. So, Batman animated. All right. Uh, when I was here, uh, in college. That was right when the show started airing. So I'm actually remember programming my VCR to record cartoons and I had to leave class early to go home every day to watch it. And I figured, you know, kind of like work and I'm doing it for my classwork. So uh, when that cartoon, cartoon came on the air, it just blew me away. Uh, there, was, there was something about the style, the simplicity of it, but the power of it. And that really pushed me in a way to simplify my style that I think I, I learned a lot from. And then after Impulse ended, uh, I, I really felt like I'd done what I could do with Impulse because that was about two years of, of steady work. And I, I called the editor and I said, I, I kind of think that I'm, I'm, I'm ready to move on. And he said, well, this, this makes this phone call so much easier because you're fired. Uh, we were looking for a new break as well. So we were going to bring a new artist. And so the fact that you want to leave, that's perfect. Uh, and then uh, my best friend at the time, Todd, called me up a little bit later. I said, dude, I'm going to start writing Impulse. This is going to be great. And I said, well, I just quit. I mean, we're not going to we're not going to work on Impulse. But then we came up with our own book, which I'll get to in a little bit. So uh, after Impulse, I did work on the Batman 
animated book for a couple issues. And then I worked on Batman Beyond for two years, uh, which was based on the cartoon that I think is 20 odd years old now. Uh, yeah, it's crazy when you think about this stuff. So the cover on the far right is one of the Batman Beyond covers I did, but I did some Harley Quinn stuff like that. And, you know, when I was working on these books and then and, and DC would send you a pile of, of books every time you get, did a book. And back then they would see like 25 copies of a comic. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with these? So I started giving them away whenever I could, or I bring them to comic convention stuff. And then I realized now all those Harley Quinn books are worth like 20, 30 bucks each, which just their own money away. But you never know. Cause I've got piles of other books lying around um like some of these uh when you work in comics sometimes you, you draw the whole story sometimes you draw the cover and a lot of times now they do multiple covers on books and they have different themes on the covers so i got contacted by one of my friends at dc to do some of these variant covers and they were based on the teen titans cartoon at the time or uh they're putting in warner brothers characters the, the daffy duck so, you know, you never know what you're going to get for a job. And sometimes they're a lot of fun like this. And I've done even more covers uh, over the last 30 years. I think I've done a lot of different covers for different publishers. And sometimes they're as simple as, uh, uh, you know, the, a store now can say, I want to cover for, for my own copy of this book we're going to be selling. And that might be the Darkwing Duck was a store in New Hampshire it had me do a cover for them. And then another store in New Hampshire asked for that Archie cover. And then uh, the publisher who's working on the Lilo and Stitch books has me doing a series of covers for those. And those are available at all comic shops. So the market, sometimes you can get exclusive. Sometimes it's a, a variant. Sometimes it's a the store has to buy 50 copies of that one of that cover to get one of the other ones. So it's a weird uh, process these days. Sometimes I see covers that I really would like to get, but I, I'm not going to spend that much money on them. But sometimes uh, they're worth it. Okay. And as, as my son said, there's even more covers. So Powerpuff Girls, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a book that I, I drew the whole issue and I thought, man, this is going to be awesome because it's the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I love them. And it's going to be them fighting crazy ninjas and stuff. And then I got the story and it was a, a weird alien plant planet and there was nothing but plants and and weird little sprouts and things. And and I said, huh, well, okay, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm going to draw that. And as, as a, you know, uh, illustrator as as someone who takes on a job you do the job you're given you may not have a connection to it you try to find that connection uh yeah, i've done some some stories where i thought yeah this is going to be great and it and it wasn't really what i expected and i did the best with it and i hope that it showed that i tried uh also did this captain america series over at marvel it was it was kind of a, a take on another story an existing story but it's more of an all-ages book and i didn't Captain America miniseries. I did an Iron Man miniseries. I did a book called Heroes, which was about teenage superhero, uh, female superheroes, which was weird because I was a middle-aged white dude draw this book. Uh, it didn't quite fit, I think. I think there are much more appropriate artists who've uh, done more since then. And now we're up to the Prapanots. This is the book that my friend Todd uh, and I created about 20 years ago now. And after we realized we weren't going to work on Impulse and Todd had already created Telos with our friend Mike, he said, what do you want to do? What do you like? And we both really agreed that we like the weird, the unknown, the cryptids, the Bigfoots and Chupacabra. So we, we kind of hammered out this idea of what we wanted. And it was, it was a team of a Bigfoot, a ghost, a Chupacabra, a Mothman, and they go on adventures, and it was kind of like the X Files, but Boulder and Scully were Bigfoot, and it was like the X Men, but but not really as as serious, and like Hellboy, but not ne nearly as serious. And it was we walked through several different publishers and looking at this. Now we started at Dark Horse Comics. We were there for 
for two miniseries. And then we got the rights back. We brought it to Image Comics. We were there for a while. And after, I think maybe, three or four years at Im Image, we took some time off and then we self-published some stuff. And then we've been working with a different publisher recently and then that didn't quite work out. So we're back to self-publishing, which is kind of cool because then you've got your, your destiny in your own hands. You're, you're in charge of whether you succeed or not. Uh, you can make all your own decisions and, and not be beholden to corporate saying this has to happen or this should happen. Or, you know, if you're willing to lose your own money, that's different than losing the publisher's money or not making as much money. So yeah, that's, that's me and Todd. And, uh, you know, the, one of the fun things about it is that, you know, we started doing some merchandise of our own. So we made a plush Chupacabra character. And that's a whole different style of animation, uh, illustration that it took me a while to figure out. But, I, you know, doing a turnaround like that and then figuring out the color patterns and setting them off. We work with a, a manufacturer in China and showing them what colors we needed for different textures. And then they would send the photo to our, our middleman. And they would say, what do you think? And we'd make some changes and this and that. So because it was our own character, our own project, we were much more involved in every step of the way. Whereas if I was doing that design for, say, Marvel or DC, I would send that drawing off and then maybe a, the finished product might show up in my office or something like that. So it's kind of a, a neat step in, in the creative process. And we made our own uh, publishing imprint called Plays Well with Otters. And we uh, found out that people like otters. So we sell t-shirts and, and patches and stickers and stuff like that. Uh, okay, this is uh, a quick breakdown of the process of, of I'm sure, people might or might not know how comics really happen. And it starts with, with a layout, a very simple sketch, a very simple idea of the basics. And that way I don't worry about details. I don't worry about uh, anything, but really the essentials of where the figure is and the proportions and if it works. And then nowadays, you know, I, I did this digitally. So I could say, well, I'm gonna switch it around. I'm gonna shrink this, I'm gonna move this as opposed to having to erase it and then start all over again, and erase it, start all over again. And then I ended up uh, printing that out, tightening it up, and then I, I inked it traditionally with a, a pen and scanned it. So that's the uh, the, the inks. So it's a very clean line that, that's able to scan and reproduce well. And then I did the colors myself in Photoshop, which is one of the programs folks use these days. I know there are people are using uh, Procreate for colors, as well as Clip Studio Paint, I think is the other big one these days. And uh, for the final, I just took a photograph from a hike in New Hampshire and just kind of photo manipulated it because I kind of like that that style of uh, Fametti, I think they call it. Just using real photos in the background. It was, I did a whole series of covers with our characters and just different photos that I had taken. random jobs you get as an illustrator, you know, as you're waiting for a script to come through or you're waiting for a, a job to happen or you don't have any work, uh, things come up and it may not have been what you thought you were going to do. Sometimes it's a lot of fun. I got re contacted by Topps Trading Cards. They said, we're doing a whole series of sketch cards, uh, Star Wars trading cards. And I used to love buying them as a kid. And, and now they do these things where they would have artists draw trading cards and just they would randomly throw them into packs. So you never know what you're going to get. And I jumped at the chance and I said, yes, I will do these. And it was, it was not a job that paid well by any stretch, but it was, it was a lot of fun. And I really appreciated that. And then I ended up doing, so this is those more. And then I want to say there's a, another set comes up here okay yeah so then uh one of the the perks or the reasons they don't pay you a lot of money when you do these cards per card is they would say and you get a batch at the end that you can do what you want with and then you get them and you can sell them and then the collectors would say i would love to buy a color picture of boba fett so you put a little more time and effort into the ones you're going to sell and that actually makes the whole job worthwhile and as a star wars fan 
this was great. I did some for like Marvel. I did some for Raiders of the Lost Ark and that. Uh, people who have made a living out of doing trading cards. And I, I applaud it because after about maybe two or three sets, I said, I'm done. It's a lot of work. Uh, okay, besides comics, I've also been lucky enough to do some licensing work for, for, for Hasbro because they're right down the road. Uh, and sometimes it's just concept work. And that's a lot, a lot of this was, was they, they were just looking for artists to do some concept stuff. Uh, they were trying to figure out a line of, of maybe different, when, when the uh, latest Star Wars trilogy came out, they were looking for different age appropriate styles. So this was the youngest audience. And then the one on the right was a little older, but not quite full on teenager yet. I think it was like tweens it was an early, uh, younger kids still. And then someone else was designing, uh, was pitching a line of, uh, I think they were plushes, uh, My Little Pony and Transformers because that's, that's the properties they own. And you know, I did dozens of those drawings as well. And I've done other random stuff. And that's, that's one of those jobs you get as an illustrator. Like I did a whole series of these weird little uh, Batman tie-in comic books that were showed up in uh, cereal boxes, and they were only about yay big. But and they were tied into the to the the one with the Joker, which was kind of a darker movie. But they were also trying to make it more kid friendly. So there was one of those things where you do the whole job, and they say, "Oh, those are great. By the way, can you take out all the guns? Can you?" change that can you put in like walkie talkies or something silly like that so i'm gonna pay you really well so i said gladly uh and now we're up to young hellboy uh this is the latest project that i'm working on right now and, and i'm working on it with, with mike mignola who created hellboy and and tom stagowski is a writer I, i've been a fan of mike's for for decades and He came up to me at one of the Boston Comic Cons several years ago and said, I, I kind of think we have something you might be good for. And Tom came by and said, yeah, I think we could work on this. And then they offered me Young Hellboy. So I've done two series so far. Uh, we did the, the first one was called The Hidden Land and the second one was called Assault on Castle Death. And hopefully there's more coming up soon. And this is a project where it was it was one of those things where, where Mike has such a huge influence. I tried not to look at what he did and try to copy what he did because I could never do that. He was trying to figure out my own take on something that feels enough like Hellboy that it fits, but it's not slavishly copying someone else's style because it would just be a pale imitation. And again, that's one of the things we've talked about as, as an artist is that to try to figure out a style that's your own it may have to fit in a certain genre or a category but you can still put your own spin on it. all right this is uh the process of comics in case you don't know like i said earlier is that i would get a script and it might say okay so there's a page with one two three four five six panels on it and we'll break it down like panel one is a is a shot of lobster johnson getting attacked by a giant cyborg lion and then panel two is a reaction shot of hellboy and there's going to be a dialogue on it and then panel three is a is a stack of, of old rugs but hellboy is, is kind of delirious at this point so he thinks they're they're missiles and I would do the breakdowns really rough, really quick um, on the left-hand side. And then I might get notes back from an editor. I'd send them in. They'd say, well, make sure you leave enough room for dialogue or make sure you make this clearer or this doesn't work and, and change this. So then I would do that. And then I would uh, go in and ink it and then send those in. And once I've sent those in, those would be colored and lettered by someone else. It's a big collaborative process versus doing everything by yourself. And when I first started, I used to have to run out to make photocopies and run to make sure I hit the last FedEx drop off at seven o'clock down by the airport. 
uh, to get them to the office the next day. And nowadays you just scan it, hit send, and you're done. So that's the same, uh, another quick layout that I had done digitally on the right and then the finished inks next to that. That's me, that's my website. If you want to know more, you can go there, craigrusso.com. And uh, that's the Perhapanov right there. Those are the three trades that we were putting back in print. Uh, and thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So I think that's what I've got to say right now, but now we have some question and answers, right? Yeah. Please. So if anyone has questions from the room, if you could please come up to this mic over here. It will not bite you. I promise. Probably. Well, somebody's coming. Bless you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mason. Yeah. Uh, Two questions. Okay. Marvel or DC? <laughs> You've worked with both, so D you, you got to have a favorite. DC. All right. But Marvel movies. Ooh, okay. And um, I just I was just curious, do you like um, layouts, inking, coloring? Which, which process do you like more? Lately, I like uh, the the creative process of doing the layouts and, and the, the problem solving or figuring out how to tell that story. Uh, and then sometimes it gets you get bogged down with the details and that becomes a little bit boring. But I also like the fact that when I can, I can do my own stuff like this, I'm doing it all. Whereas with some of the corporate stuff, I have to send in my pencils and my inks and then it's gone. And I have no idea. Hopefully the color is going to do a good job. They may or they may not, you know, I may, or they may do a good job, but it's not what I expected where it's a much more collaborative process where this I get to do it all. So I, f I find different challenges. So I try to keep it. So I like doing it all because if I didn't, then I'd really, uh, I'd have a problem. Wouldn't, wouldn't have a job. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Oh, hi, I'm Zach. Um, my question, I got two, but what's your favorite superhero you've worked on on DC and Marvel? Okay. Uh, Batman for sure at DC, but then if you said, "Oh, is it the animated Batman or is it the the Batman, the uh, Adam West Batman?" I did, I did some stuff with that comic book several years ago, and that might be my favorite because just growing up, I, I just could not get enough of that old goofy TV show. So Batman. And the other question was going to be like, how do you like go at uh, creating young Hellboy, like the concept arts of him? You know what? Uh, he has shown up as young Hellboy in a few different books. And there's one that was called The the Midnight Circus that Duncan Fricardo drew. And it was fantastic. And I started looking at it and then I said no. And I closed it and I put it away because I didn't want to be influenced by what he did. And I just tried to figure out what my take on a young Hellboy would be. And I looked at what Mike had done with the character. And I don't think my young Hellboy looks like the way Mike has drawn young Hellboy. So at first I kept drawing him and I was thinking of my kids as they were growing up and I gave them my kids proportions and I would get notes back from Mike saying too tall, too thin. And then the one that finally clicked and I still have to keep bringing myself back is like, think about Charlie Brown and his weird little proportions, <laughs> his big head and those short little legs. And that, that clicked. Whereas I was at one point was drawing him like tall, gawky teenager, like impulse, which I was used to doing. And a weird fact is that my son uh, dressed up like Impulse a couple of years ago for Halloween, looked exactly like him. It was, it was uncanny. So I was drawing him and I didn't even know it years ago. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is also Zach. I was <laughs> I was curious of a couple things. One, is there a character perhaps um, that you haven't um, done work for that you would like to in the future? And two, um, do you like um, doing your own stuff uh, like publishing and writing and designing your own stuff versus uh, like doing it for a bigger publisher? Uh, is there, do you like it one or the other better? There are benefits to both. I mean, being the creative freedom to do your own thing is really amazing. And, and I really enjoy that. And, I, and 
when we can put our story and say, this is us. Like, I think the Parapanauts is, is Todd and I telling the story that we want to tell. We're not being driven by, well, uh, Batman has to be here in six months. So this has to happen to get into there. So you could tell the story you want, but it has to happen in the confines of this. And by the way, this is happening over in this book. So you can't really do that. And this is happening here. You can't touch that. And we really would like this to happen. So it's a very different concept, but I, I again, working at, at DC on Batman was nice because there's a paycheck involved and, and there's recognition of that character versus, you know, these characters. So, Again, it's it's really tough to just choose one or the other, and and having the luxury of doing both, I think, is pretty amazing. To be able to say, I'm working on Young Hellboy, which is a steady paycheck, and I'm working on the Perhaps Nots, which may not be a steady paycheck now, but may pay off in the future. Uh, so, to be able to do both, I think, is is incredibly lucky, and I, I can't stress enough how fortunate I am to be able to do that. And as a character that I want to work on that I haven't, it'd probably be Thor. I I was going to do some samples for a Thor book, and then I got pulled on to an Iron Man, the Iron Man miniseries, which I thought was was great. And then they ended up getting a different team to do the Thor book, and it was an artist that I really loved, and the book was amazing, so I was glad to see that. But at some point, I'd still like to go back and, and do something with them. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Philip. Uh, what's your favorite color? Favorite color? Orange. All right. Uh, and then what's the weirdest story you ever got to work on? Oh, weirdest story. Um, you know, there's one story where uh, I... They said, hey, do you want to come back and draw some Batman Beyond? And I said, yeah, that'll be great. I haven't done this book in, in like 10, 20 years, I guess. I said, great, we want to draw it in that kind of anime style. And it, it's kind of tying into a story we've done. And and Bruce Wayne and and uh, Barbara Gordon have had an affair and, and she cheated on Dick Grayson and then she got pregnant and then he got, uh, you know, he knocked her up and then he was going to get engaged, but then she has a miscarriage. You want to draw that? I said, there's a paycheck involved, right? <laughs> so uh, I drew it, but man, I did I did not like that story. That that that's fair. No one yeah. likes the Batman uh Batgirl thing. No, was, no, was, no one but Bruce Tim likes it. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have two questions. So the first one is do you draw digitally or traditionally now? Yes. I do both. Oh, okay. I, I do a lot of my layouts on my iPad. I bring I can bring it anywhere I can go, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I can watch TV while I'm doing the layouts. And I can, again, I can make my changes, which which is very easy for me to do versus having to erase and lay out or erase. But I will I'll print out those blue lines um, on 11 by 17 Bristol board. Then I'll ink those traditionally and then I'll scan those. And that gives me a chance to A, work physically and have something tangible when I'm done that I can sell, which is part of the bonus of, of doing artwork. And, and I, I just, the, I can get tech textures and, and line work that I'm not, I haven't found yet digitally and vice versa. There's some brushes that I found appropriate that I can't figure out how to recreate in a video. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, uh, do you think that your style was inspired by your um your urge to make comics, or do you think that just ended up like playing a part? It's like this act, this style works with the the comics or like this industry because sometimes certain styles only work with certain fields. Yeah, stuff. no, I, I I think it really it was uh you know comics and cartoons growing up. Like I, mm -hmm. I was obsessed with cartoons and and Super Friends and and stuff like that and comic books and. And I have a hard time not drawing in that kind of style. When I was doing some of the, the fine arts paintings and stuff, I did some some Trump Loy style paintings, and one of them took me months. And I thought, this is oh, this is so slow. Like I could just bang out like dozens of drawings if I was just drawing in a fun style. Mm -hmm. And I will change my style slightly for different projects. I'll try to find something new, and I, I don't have it on here 
I think there's a section on my website where one of the things I do for fun is, is when I go to concerts lately, I make up posters. I make my own quick little concert posters. And mm -hmm. I can always try something different there because there's no client. There's no one saying, you can't do that or that doesn't work. And sometimes they go off the rails. Sometimes it's a fun experiment that goes well. Sometimes the, I can actually talk to the band about it and that's kind of cool. Um, but that was different styles that made, they still kind of feel like comic books where I think everything is influenced in that in some way. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hi, my name's Ben. I was just uh, wondering if there was like any exercises or like practices, practices you did to like get better at illustration throughout the years or? You know what? I, I constantly drew. I still do. I, I, I'm drawing daily. Some of it is, is for money. I get paid to do sketches. People will, will send me commission requests and I can I can draw that if they want a picture of Batman, I'll, I'll draw a picture of Batman. Or you want to draw Wolverine, I'll draw that. But some of it is just uh, drawing for fun where I'll watch a TV show and I'll draw out that character. I'll try to figure out likenesses. And it's it's that always drawing thing, drawing hands. I mean, I can't tell you how many hands I've drawn. And, you know, I, I can look at comic books and see what they've done and try to figure out what works and what doesn't. But the biggest feedback I can give anybody is, is draw. I mean, it really, draw anything you see. And if you want to come up with a style, say, man, like I love the way uh, Mike Mignola draws with those, those heavy shadows and he's, kind of figured out how to eliminate all all the detail, but he's got a couple little lines that, that express everything. It's because he figured out what's underneath those shadows first. And he's figured out how to draw all that and then stylized it. So I think once you learn the basics, then you can figure out how to push past that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one last question. What was your favorite class at CBPA? Favorite class here? I get, I really enjoyed my painting classes. I had a, I was saying that I had a painting studio and this is well before all of your time, before the Star Building, I guess, is in New Bedford. They had another campus, it was part of uh, the Swain School of Design. They had a studio there. And I had a studio that I would go to and I would, I'd spend like six hours a day over there painting. And I was, I was just engrossed in it. And sometimes I'd stay like nine hours. Sometimes I'd stay 12 hours. Some days I wouldn't go at all, uh, but it was one of those things where I was when I was in the in the mood to paint. It was fantastic. Thank you. Hi. Oh, sorry, sorry, Nathan. If I can say one thing, just take an illustration class for your first question. You and your brother can just swap for one day, right? Yeah. Oh well, hi, I'm Nathan. Um, I just had a quick question about uh, when you were working with any of the companies, did you find any difficulties in like communication about getting their ideas across in your art? Mm, not really. Uh, you know, the, usually I should have brought a copy of the script, but scripts are usually pretty, I don't know if you've ever seen a comic book script, but they're, they're pretty straightforward. They'll, they'll break it down. Some, sometimes they're very descriptive. Sometimes they're less descriptive, but I would, I would usually just send in my, my, my layouts and they would either say, yes, that's perfect or no. Uh, why don't you, we need more of this or, and they're usually the feedback is, is quick and instant and easy to fix. So then I could uh, digitally change things and send it back versus having to fax things over in the olden days and wait for a reply of faxed back and not trying to figure out what they meant by the little scribbles. But more often than not, again, as I've been doing so long where I think that I've figured out how to tell a story and tell it uh, clearly. I, one of the, the things that happened, one of the first things when I was working on Impulse, uh, I was so impressed by other artists what they were doing with storytelling and page layouts. And they were doing all these crazy things. And I started trying to figure out if I could do that. And my editor said, uh, you're losing the thread. You're, you're not really telling that story. And they hired uh, an artist named Sal Buscema to do breakdowns for me for three issues. And Sal was a legend in comics and he had drawn the Hulk for 20 years. And he would just send me these drawings, uh, blue line drawings of the pages. And they were very simple. They weren't, they weren't flashy, but they told the story in a way that made sense. And that ever since then, I've always thought the story needs to come first. Like I, there are some artists, I love their work, but I, I can't 
follow the story. Uh, whereas I'd rather you go, uh, well, page layout's a little boring. It's just a grid, but you can read. I mean, it's it's always like, if I hand this comic book to someone who doesn't read comics, can they figure it out? And that's how I approach it. So I think a lot of times the editors can see that when I'm sending in my, my pages. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi. <laughs> um, I had a question. I was wondering um, if you were to, I'm not 100%, I wasn't really here the first part, um, but um, if you were to give some advice to somebody who is wanting, thinking of like making their own comic book or their own graphic novel, like what would you like give them for like tips or tricks? So uh, I, I was saying earlier that getting into comics now is so different than when I got in. But the advice that I give people at conventions who have ideas for comics is a start small. Don't don't start with your I'm I'm going to tell the next Sandman story because that's that's a lot. It's a commitment right there. Start small and and do it. You know you can physically go to photocopy stuff at Kinkos and bam you've made yourself a zine. You can put it online. You've done it, and then built up an audience that way. Uh, the The traditional path of, of sending samples in and, and talking to editors is changing quite a bit, and you don't necessarily need that anymore. You can control your own fate. And again, if, if the property of the is good enough and and your talent is there, like people will will find it. People will follow you, and and it'll it'll grow in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, thank you. So there are no Zoom questions, correct? Okay, if you're on Zoom and you can hear, I don't know if they can hear me. They can, great. <laughs> uh, you can enter questions in the chat. We neglected to say that before, I apologize. Um, does anyone else have questions for Craig? Okay, thank you guys for such great questions. Some really fun ones there. Um, we talked a little bit about how style before and how you were able to sort of put yourself into it this is i love that because i just talked about that today in class how, how do you put yourself in you you need to win and also the publisher needs to win at the same time right is there a title or something that you've made i think i know the answer to this but i'm gonna ask it anyway um that you feel is closest to your natural hand and way of thinking visually it, it's the brapanas it's brapanas right yeah. yeah okay i mean it's it's the style has changed over the last yeah. 20 years but that's that's me it's unfiltered without uh any editorial interference or you know having to look like someone else do it so, or it's it's funny to see other people draw my characters for a change because i you know in my head that's what they look like but then you know when we get a cover from walter simonson and i go oh that's how would i how, how i would have drawn that but that is amazing or you know some artists have just blew me away with with some of their takes and and that's that's kind of a neat feeling, right? You can always I would draw my take of other characters, but seeing other people draw my characters is, is humbling. Um, one thing that's been on my mind a lot is with the explosion, like of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, thinking about how much we see the same characters over and over and over again, and you know, people like you and me, we get our in by drawing someone else's intellectual property, and then right, there's continuity and there's all yeah. this stuff. Um, and, uh, what I'm wondering is since you've worked on Perhapanauts and a couple other titles that you've come up with, with a writer or by yourself, how do you see us sort of broadening the field in this way? There have been adaptations, right. Of, you know, I think of like Umbrella Academy yeah. and stuff like that, where, um, there's newer titles coming out that are, that are being expanded and that are becoming bigger franchises, but how do we continue to broaden that? You know what I'm saying? It, I, I think so. I mean, I think that it, again, there are so many platforms out there also, like, I mean, you go on, uh, Amazon prime right now and you've got the invincible cartoon, which is crazy from Robert Kirkman. And, uh, and then you've also got the boys show which was another comic book that was and you've got netflix has the umbrella academy and they just had another book that's loosely based on a dc book show up this week i think called bodies yeah and then you know you've got all the more scott pilgrim you've got marvel and you get dc you've got 
all these channels are, are coming up, they're looking for content. So I think that you've got to find the right people who can get your content out there. And uh, again, nowadays, I mean, you can you can animate your own thing. You can you can put together a sizzle reveal, or you can you can do some three D sculpts of your own property and have that to show off as a proof of concept. I think, which is. Do you feel like there are specific types of characters or stories that make the transition well? Uh, you know, this is sort of like the ensemble cast with the cryptid sort of mystery setup. And it, but it's really fickle. I think that you never know. Whereas this has been been in Hollywood a couple times where people were were this close to to kind of coming up with a deal, but then oh, that movie with the other monsters that we thought was going to be great didn't. So er, better luck next time. Or uh, it goes up the ladder, and you, you're working your way up the ladder. You're talking, you're making the connections, and then there's uh, a regime change at a at a studio, and they clean their slate and say we're going to start new. So I've had some friends deal with that. I was talking about uh, one earlier. So it's and even I mean, even with a signed contract, you don't know what's going to happen until you actually see it on TV. You're welcome. Anything else? Anybody? No. Yeah, I mean, I guess now we can we can uh, say goodbye to the Zoom people. Bye. Uh, and if you're still here, I, I did bring a portfolio of original artwork uh, that's physical. You guys can look at and some comic books and stuff like that. So uh, come on down.